And um, so this is now part two on that section in 1 Timothy 3 verse 3c, which says they're free from the love of money. And I think that it's important that we then spend our time this evening looking at that once more. But let's read through 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, and then we'll pray and get into the preaching this evening. And I hope to bring something of a conclusion to that section that we look at. It is a trustworthy saying, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but considerate, peaceable, free from the love of money, leading his own household well, having his children in submission with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to lead his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation of the devil." And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Lord, we do pray that as we come to this passage once more, we've been in it for some time, but we thank you for your Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us and working with us as a congregation. Thank you for the truths that we see in a passage like this. And I do pray that you would minister to our hearts this evening, that we would trust in you, Lord, to open up to us the areas that need challenging in our own hearts and in our own lives as believers. We do pray that we would look to the marvelous price that you have paid for us at the cross. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work that you have done. We thank you that we have been bought with a, with a price, the precious price of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that we would give everything to you, that we would hold nothing back, that we would be a people for your glory, that we would ourselves offer ourselves up daily as a living sacrifice to you, that we would lay ourselves before you, being willing for you to use us in any way you see fit. We pray, Lord, that you would use every bit of us, our lives, our emotions, our finances, our gifts, our talents, the areas that you have gifted us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that we would be a people that, that hold nothing back from our great God, who is worthy of all of our praise and all of our glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do think that there are three major challenges that we've seen throughout history, but even in our time, we have something called narcissism, hedonism, and materialism. And materialism is something that we see very much alive and well in our day. I don't think that we've ever been at a time where we are as opulent as what we are as the Church of the Lord, especially in a, let's say, a more Western-like kind of a world. If we think about even ourselves at a Benoni Bible Church, um, nobody really sees themselves as rich financially because they'll often compare themselves to those that have more than them. And so they'll see themselves as, well, we just get by, you know, but many have multiple vehicles. We have homes. We have roofs over our heads. We have um, so much that the Lord has given us. We have food in our fridges. We open our cupboards and we have multiple uh, shirts and jackets to choose. You know, in the morning I get up and I'm saying to Maxine, well, which jacket should I wear today? Because we, I have more than one jacket that I can wear. And that is God's kindness towards us. But we should be content, even if we just have the clothes on our back, the food in our tummy that's digesting, and we have a future that is secured. And materialism really stands out as one of those prevalent maladies of our time. We're always wanting more than what we have, and we're never happy with what we have. Where we should have, as I mentioned last week, that, that in, ill contentment with our spiritual growth, that we should be ill content about. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to speak more like him. I want to look more like him. I want to think more like him. That should be part of the, the heart cry of the Christian. But then we seem to be content spiritually, but ill content materially. And that betrays something of a love towards money that we have been warned about in the scriptures. And this is not just something that is a requirement for pastors and overseers. Of course, in the context of 1 Timothy 3, this is to the overseer. This is about the overseer. But one of the reasons that he needs to be somebody free from the love of money is he ought to be an example to the flock of what being free from the love of money looks like. He ought to be exemplary in regard to being free from the love of money because the rest of the congregation is meant to be mimicking that, is meant to be following that, is meant to have a model that they're able to look up to and shepherds that are ahead of them that actually show what this looks like to the rest of the flock. So this is inter integral in regard to the characteristic 
of the overseer being blameless or above reproach. And remarkably, this standard is not something that is exclusive to the overseers. This is not something that God commands just to Henny and Rocky in Benoni Bible Church. But this is something that is to be echoed by all believers. And I want us to think about this because I, I do believe that the Holy Spirit has his, his own wonderful way of dealing with us as a congregation in a time like this, with a passage like this, as we think about the application of this to not be those that are enamored by the glitz and the glamour and by the, the extra bit of money that we might even have in our church's bank account. The Lord has been very kind to us, but we need to be a people that are, that are not moved with the love of money. We must love the Savior. We must love the Lord who has called us. And throughout the scriptures, believers are taught the virtue of contentment and commanded to steer clear of the entanglement of riches, even the distraction that that might bring and the choking that the love of this world can bring to that, that soil, those weeds in a sense. We need to be careful of this. And the Apostle Paul in various epistles really shows us the importance of contentment. We looked at that last week in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, but he issues also a warning against the love of money a little bit further on in 1 Timothy 6. And you'll notice that tonight you're going to see how, and I want to show you this, how often you can see that the love of money is, the, is something that is key when it comes to a false shepherd. And when you have a wolf in sheep's clothing, that's what you, that is the common that is the common thing that is there with all those that are actually false. But look at 1 Timothy 6, and I want us to read from verse 3 to, 6 to 12, because this is still in the book of Timothy, and it also would, if you, remember, if you think about this, the way that this church would have received this book by Timothy, he would have been reading this to Ephesus, and Ephesus would have read the whole book. They would have had the whole context of the book. We're looking just at a little piece in the verse, in the verse three, in chapter three, but I want us to also see how this fits into the broader context. And we did that last week with First Timothy five, when we saw the way that an overseer and an elder that is actually um, working hard at preaching and teaching is worthy of double honor. And we looked at some of that last week because he's not saying to keep an overseer uh, from the love of money, you should just give no salary. Not at all. He's actually talking the opposite of that when it comes to the way that the church has a responsibility towards the overseer. But then we see in 1 Timothy 6, verse 3 to 12, the following. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited, understanding nothing but having a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, slander, evil suspicions and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who support, who suppose rather that godliness is a means of gain. You see what happens with somebody that's like this, somebody that is a false teacher, one of the things that they believe is that godliness is a means of gain. This is somehow going to profit me. And so they false prophets to get a profit. But godliness actually is a means of great gain. So Paul puts this argument on its head. He says godliness is actually a means of great gain. Not in the way that these guys are thinking, but in a different way. When accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out either. So where should the baseline of our contentment be? We came into this world with nothing. We're going to leave this world with nothing. But we have Jesus. We have everything. And this is part of where godliness really has got great gain. And if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Isn't that a warning regarding materialism and regarding a love for money? And he's speaking in context here regarding false teachers who think that godliness is a means to gain and they have it they have a fully, they have a, a wrong view of this. They skewed in their understanding of this. He says, those who wish to get rich, they fall into temptation 
and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. So there you can see the root issue of the desire of the heart. This doesn't mean that having money is bad, but there's a desire in an individual. I want that. That's what I'm here for. That's what I need to get. There's this desire in their heart, and that desire in the heart, because of their love of wealth, their love of money, it leads them towards all forms of other sin. And oftentimes it actually disappoints them, big time. And then it says in verse 10 and 11, For the love of money, which is the exact thing that he says that overseers must not have, the love of money, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evils. And some, by aspiring to it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There just seems to be a real strong warning here, and Paul seems to have people in mind that he's thinking about in regard to this. Because he says, some have actually wandered away from the faith as a result of this, the love of money. This heart desire that goes, I want to get. I must get. That's what I'm here for. I must pursue this. Everything's about the rands and cents. Everything's about the business. Everything's about how much we can keep, how much we can save, how much we can put into a bank account. This is what it's all about. Some have actually pierced themselves, plunged men into ruin and destruction. But you, and yeah, Paul speaks very poignantly to Timothy. And praise God, there's a second Timothy. There's a book called Second Timothy where Timothy does not actually reject Paul, does not go away from Paul, is one of the few that has not abandoned Paul and is going to face more persecution. Second Timothy was the last book that Paul wrote out of his 13 epistles. He says, but you, O man of God, flee from these things. Run like a gazelle from a lion. Get away from these things. Part of these things is the love of money. Again, he's reiterating what he said earlier on in chapter 3. And pursue righteousness. While you are simultaneously running away from these things, this list of things that false teachers do, don't go that way, Timothy. While you run from those things, run to righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. That's with the whole putting off, putting on. Flee from this, run to that. There's the list. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. You see, part of the problem is that with many, they seem to be taking a hold of the temporal. And they sacrifice the future on the altar of the right now. And they take a hold of this life and the stuff of this world instead of laying hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. It would seem that the Apostle Paul has a genuine concern even for his son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy, there's others that have wandered away because they have this. And I think that this is very much the key element that leads towards all of these other evils within ministry. This love of money. There's others that have wandered away, Timothy. Don't do it. You stay, you fight the good fight, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. So thus an overseer is to exemplify financial integrity. That's what an overseer is called towards. Now as I mentioned last week, that doesn't mean that the overseer doesn't have challenges in these areas. This doesn't mean that the overseer doesn't have the same issues that you have as members of a local congregation, the same kind of expenses, the same kind of temptations and difficulties, but we're called to flee these things and to pursue the righteous way of God. The overseer is to set an example in line with the broader scriptural call for all believers to resist the allures of materialism. Remember that rich young man that came to Jesus? What should I do to get eternal life? Oh, keep the Ten Commandments. Oh, I've done all of that. I've done it all. I, I have a suspicion, and I'm wondering to see it one day when I get into heaven. I think that that rich young ruler was possibly Barnabas, who later on would sell his stuff, lay it at the apostles' feet, and then he would actually come. 
and uh, serve the Lord. So I'm waiting to see one day when I get to heaven if that rich young ruler, because Jesus looked at him with love, but he didn't go run after him. He didn't call him back. In fact, Jesus does things very differently than what we're often tempted to do in church ministry. In church ministry, we're so tempted to just run after everybody and keep everybody happy. And we end up not making Jesus pleased. And we end up actually not pleasing anybody anyway. (laughs) Because as you try and please this one, you displease that one. And you can't live like that. You've got to be pleasing the Lord. and And those that love the Lord will be pleased by that. They will be pleased too, because they want to please the Lord. But the overseer is to exemplify this financial integrity. I want us to look into a couple of aspects this evening, and one of these aspects is the destructive grip of the love of money in ministry. And before you think that this is just something for the overseers or the deacons in our church, this is for you as a member because you've been called to ministry as well. You know that one of the tasks of an overseer and an elder is to equip the saints for the works of ministry? That's what Ephesians 4 says. That's part of our job title. It's to help you be matured so that you minister. Well, let's look at the destructive grip of the love of money in ministry. And I want us to recognize this danger in in a few ways. One of them by looking at some biblical warnings. And I want us to think about two individuals. There are others, but I think that these kind of uphold this for us in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. One of them being Balaam. Remember Balaam? Balaam the false prophet. I mean, what a, I mean, who else had a donkey speak to him? Right? Balaam. If we think about this cautionary tale, it's there in Numbers chapter 22 to chapter 24. He was hired to come and put a curse on Israel by Balak, King Balak. He was something of a sorcerer, but God intervenes. And God tells him, no, 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 you can't do this. He even gets the donkey to stop and speak to him. He's got, there's an angel with a sword and this donkey has served Balaam well. And the donkey turns around and says, why are you beating me? I've actually just saved your life. So he is sought out by King Balak to curse the Israelites. And he becomes entangled in the allure of wealth. Because Balak, God says to him, don't go, Balaam. Don't even go there. But Balak sends more messengers to tell him there's lots of money involved in this. Come, come and curse Israel. Eventually, Balaam still goes, even though God had directly told him not to go. And even when he gets there, God prohibits Balaam from actually speaking the curse that he was paid to do. And in the end, both Balaam and Balak are beheaded by Israel because he's a false prophet. So God even speaks to this man. God even causes the donkey to speak to this man. God shows this man his purposes regarding Israel. He prevents him from cursing. Instead, he opens his mouth and he blesses Israel. There's miracle after miracle, yet Balaam's heart was still in the wrong place. Balaam still had the allure of riches and it landed up with his beheadment. He desired financial gain. He desired compromise. And it highlights the dangers for us. And why do we say this? Well, we see this in 2 Peter. And interestingly enough, 2 Peter, like what we had on what we read in 1 Timothy 6, you see that one of the marks of a false prophet, again, is the love of money. Look with me at 2 Peter 2. And I'll read a large section there for us because I want you to see the way that there's, Peter actually speaks about the rise of false prophets in the church. And then he links it to Balaam in the, in the Old Testament and in particular to the love of money. Listen to 2 Peter 2, verse 1 to 22. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false prophets among you. That's quite a grim reality. And he's speaking to Christians, and he's saying there's going to be false prophets that arise. What should you do? How should you know that they're false prophets? Let me tell you, one of the key ways that you know is the love of money who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. I think it's a very interesting little phrase, who bought them. Because that's what Jesus did at the cross. 
Jesus has paid for us. He's paid for us with his precious blood. You are a bought people. And either you're going to be sold out for Jesus or you'll be a sellout to Jesus. That's your two options. You're a bought people. Going against the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. That's the end. Swift destruction. It makes you think of the next example I'm going to give you. Let me not uh, give it away yet. And many will follow their sensuality. Here's another mark of false teaching. It leads toward sensuality. You see, because where there's idolatry, immorality is hot on the heels. So this you see. But there's a love of money that's as a root. Listen to it. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. Isn't that happening even today with false teachers? Isn't the way of truth maligned as a result of these types of individuals? Listen to verse 3. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. In their greed. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. They greed. They'll use whatever words they can to manipulate you so that you are exploited. They do not care about those that they mislead. All they care about is themselves and the pursuit that they have of illicit gain. For if God did not spare angels who sinned, but cast them into the pit and delivered them to chains of darkness, being kept for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, whom he brought, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. You see how he juxtaposes this Noah, this righteous one, compared to these false teachers. These ones who preach something else because of their greed. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes. And by the way, Sodom and Gomorrah was one of the wealthiest places there was at that time. Again, people with the love of money that led them towards all other forms of sin. So he's using these Sodom and Gomorrah as an example of this. And notice in our world even, when there's opulence and when there's that love of money, what do you start to see? That starts to happen, immorality of all kinds. If he did, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who go after the flesh in its corrupt lust and despise authority, daring, self-willed. They do not tremble when they blaspheme glorious ones. Whereas angels who are greater in strength and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these like unreasoning animals. Now notice this as he starts to talk about this in verse 12. He talks about these unreasoning animals and then he starts to talk about Balaam in a moment. God used an unreasoning animal to reason with Balaam. Okay? But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, blaspheming where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering unrighteousness as the wages of their unrighteousness. You see, there's something that they're going to earn, these false teachers. There's wages that are due to them. They're going to get what's coming their way because of their love of money. Consider it a, a, sorry, so verse 13, let's start reading again, verse 13. Suffering unrighteousness as the wages of their unrighteousness, considering it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you. 
having eyes full of adultery and unceasing sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed. What is their heart trained in? The love of money. Trained in greed. They are accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of who? Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He so badly went after Balak. Why? Because Balak was going to pay him. Even though a donkey tells him, don't go. Even though God tells him through the donkey, don't go. He just loved the sound of the ching. Loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own lawlessness. For a mute donkey speaking out with a voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been kept. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by sensual lusts of the flesh those who barely escape from the ones who conducted themselves in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if they are overcome, having both escaped the defilement of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and having again been entangled in them, then the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandments handed on to them. The message of the true proverb has happened to them. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallow in the mire. I think Peter, when he's speaking like this, even had in mind somebody like Judas. He was there at the table when Jesus would hand the cup to Judas and say, go do what you're going to do, go do it quickly. And Judas would go because Judas had betrayed Jesus and sold him. So Balaam's story is a stark reminder for believers to guard against the seductive influences of wealth and the love of money. Ensuring that our motives and our actions align with God's will and God's principles. One cannot serve money and God. You cannot. Jesus said that to us. You're either going to be sold out for Jesus or you will be a sellout regarding Jesus. That's it. Are you a lover of money? Or are you a lover of God? Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 to 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do you treasure in this life? Is it Christ who bought you with the precious purchase of his blood? The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Where are you looking in your life? What direction are you going? Where is your heart's desire? Is it the love of money? Or is it the love of Christ? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. We're called to serve one master, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to use everything that we are and everything that we have for our Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory. If he's given us a good mind, if he's given us a good business, if he's given us a good bank account, if he's given to use it for the glory of Jesus, because we serve Jesus with everything that Jesus has given us. All we have is his. 
to be used for his glory. That's one of the reasons that we do not teach a tithe at Baloney Bible Church, because that's not a New Testament teaching. What is the New Testament teaching on giving? It is grace giving. You decide what you give and give what you decide with a generous heart and with a heart that's filled with gratitude and a joyful heart. Listen to this warning for us. Judas Iscariot. There's our New Testament example of a man who had a love for money. And yet he was with Jesus. You know, he was with the twelve when they were sent out two by two to preach. He was with Jesus for the whole of Jesus' earthly ministry. Yet he was with Jesus to see what he could get from being with Jesus. Ask yourself that, dear Christian. Why are you here this evening? Why are you part of Benoni Bible Church? Why are you with Jesus? To get something from Jesus? He's already given you his whole life. We have been blessed with every blessing in the heavenly places through Jesus Christ our Lord, Ephesians tells us. We as Christians have been given heaven's greatest treasure. We've already got everything that heaven has to offer. So why are you then hanging out with Jesus? You thinking you're going to get something from him? Listen to this cautionary tale for us from Judas. Matthew 26 verse 14 to 16. Judas betrays Jesus. Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to deliver him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. And from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. What an illustration of the perilous consequences where there's the love of money that has been allowed to take root in our hearts. As Judas walked alongside Jesus, entrusted with the significant responsibility of managing the disciples' money bag. Can you imagine that? A sinister undercurrent lurked between or beneath the surface of this discipleship guise. I'm a disciple of Jesus, one of his twelve. But beneath the surface, the sinister love of money. While appearing outwardly devout, Judas's heart harbored a growing greed that manifested in the subtle acts of skimming off funds, even for personal gain. Listen to what happens there with Judas. And this is a good story to remind you of. John 12, verse 2 to 6. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. This is at Lazarus's house, his sisters, Mary and Martha. Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a liter of perfume of very costly pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was going to betray him, he doesn't say, oh, that smells so amazing. Isn't it amazing how this sister has served Jesus? Wow! Isn't it amazing how she lays everything aside for the Messiah, anointing his feet? But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was going to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Why has she done this? This was like a year's wage. Because, by the way, a denarii was a day's wage. 300 denarii, you've got 365 days in the year. You would take a couple of days off for a Sabbath. That's like a year's wage. That's how expensive this was. Now he said this, and listen to what the Bible says. Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor. You see, sometimes with the love of money, there's people that parade themselves as though they actually care about godly things. But there's a disgodly, ungodly heart's desire for the love of money. 
You find people that pray the least talk the most about these kind of things. We're so concerned about the church, but where are you at the prayer meeting? He said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. You see what the love of money has done in him? And as he had the money box, he used to take from what was put into it. I'm sure I'm, I'm deserving of this. I mean, I'm doing such a good job for Jesus and the disciples carrying the money box. I mean, what an important responsibility. Without me, they won't have a money box. And nobody will manage the money well without me. I can take a bit of this. I deserve it. Look at how well I've done. His drive was this love of money. We're told by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle John, who writes this later, he was a thief. He was a thief. He is a thief. And he remained a thief. That's why he sold Jesus. It was already in his heart. This is, by the way, before Satan had even entered his heart at the table. You see how a man actually progressively gets handed over. That's Romans 1. Handed over. Because he's not repentant. And by the way, Judas later on would have a sorrow that led to his death. Not a sorrow that led to life. Not true repentance, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 7. He had a sorrow that led to his death. Woe is me. This thing didn't actually pay out as well as I'd hoped it would. Notice that the initial compromise marked the beginning of a downward spiral for Judas, setting the stage for his ultimate betrayal of the Lord. Just a few coins from the top of the money box. Where did it end? A couple of coins to sell his Lord. Where did it end? Hanging himself. And he couldn't even do that properly because apparently he fell down from the rope and then he got burst open in his gut on the ground and bled out. Tells us in the Bible in a gruesome way that all of his insides came out. You see, all of his insides were off. He had an internal greed. And notably, Judas's love for money was exposed vividly during that feast. While Jesus has been anointed, he's angry. How dare you use that money that way? Meanwhile, she's using it for ministry to our Lord. He says, actually, this is, this is part of the preparation for my burial. Judah's story takes a very tragic turn. As the pursuit of wealth fails to even bring the satisfaction that he sought. You see, that's how deceitful riches is. The love of riches, at least. It's deceitful because even when he gets what he wants, he trades Jesus for 30 silver coins. He gets it into his hand. He gets it into his pocket. But while it's in his pocket, it burns him. He can't handle it. The grief, the guilt, the shame. His misguided love for money actually lands up in a final act of despair where he hangs himself. And that's Judas's end. He actually threw the ill-gotten gain back at those that paid him to betray Jesus. That's where the love of money will lead you if you do not repent of it. That's why we need to guard ourselves, dear church, from the love of money. The love of money will destroy Benoni Bible Church. If we allow it. It will destroy you as an individual. Judas found no solace in the riches that had fueled his betrayal. That's a cautionary tale, isn't it, for us? What an illustration. What an illustration of what our relationship with wealth ought to be like. What a profound indicator of our spiritual condition if there's that love of money within us. The love of money can either drive us 
to worship our Lord because we repent of it, or it will lead to our us being consumed by it. It will lead to destruction and mar our discipleship. So as we think about the overseer's call to be free from the love of money, Judas and the narrative as we think of Judas urges us to also evaluate our own hearts. Each individual member at Benoni Bible Church. What's our heart like regarding money? We need to be a people that ensure that our devotion to Christ remains untarnished by the allure of worldly riches. And why are we with Jesus? We ought to be with him to worship him, to glorify him, to honor him and to exalt his glorious name. Are we with Jesus for what we can get from Jesus instead of what Jesus has already done for us? I want to touch on also one or two other elements, but let me scan it briefly because I see our time is out and I do want to let us have a time of fellowship. That's important for us. But notice also that in this world, and you can jot this down in your notes, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 to 4, we see that there's a compromise when there's this desire for ear tickling. And that we see in our world as well. When financial gain becomes a primary motive for a local congregation, then there's a risk of compromising biblical principles for the sake of popularity, for comfort, for financial success. And this compromise really compromises the integrity of the gospel. What we must be about is honoring Christ and sticking to his word, come whatever may. And then we trust our Lord to provide for that. And I've been saying that to our deacons. I've said this to our church. We must do the right thing and then trust God to take care of us while we do the right thing. And that's a principle for every single individual Christian. Do the right thing and trust God to take care of you in doing the right thing. And fear not. His arm is not short. He looks after the birds of the heavens. Can he not look after us at Benoni Bible Church? Of course he can. The time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. You see, these teachers have this desire for money, and it is they're attracted by, and they are called by people that have a love for money too. Their desires betray them. And so they get a teacher like this, who has a heart that loves money, and these people know this man that has this heart for the love of money, and their desires are corrupted, so they get this guy to tickle their ears, and as he tickles their ears, they give him more money and they will turn away their ears from the truth and they will turn aside to myths when the overseer prioritizes pleasing the congregation over proclaiming the uncompromising truth of God's word it can be a very clear sign that the love of money has taken root in the heart let me put it this way if, if you're at Benoni Bible Church for like two, three, four months and you're no longer feeling any discomfort in the pew, you should probably get nervous because either, well, either you become really holy, <laughs> but we, even when we were getting these newer chairs, I said to our, our deacons, we need to get chairs that help our people to be comfortable because it should only be the preaching that makes them uncomfortable. But I also want to touch on just the coldness creep. You know, when the coldness creeps in, and here's where I think that there is a very real danger that we need to be guarding ourselves against at Baloney Bible Church. You know, I mentioned it last week, and I don't want to belabor these things, but the Lord has been incredibly good to us as a local church. Incredibly good to us. Just even from the financial state of our congregation. I mean, what a good position to be in. We've been putting a lot of money into our building renovations. We've been quite full. We've had more people here, of course, with more people. And when there's hearts that are in the right place, people are giving. And the Lord is blessing the work that we have here. But let's keep our focus on Jesus Christ. Let's not move one bit from serving the Lord Jesus with all that is within us. Let us not care so much about the provision that he has given. Praise God he's given us provision. Let's use it for his glory. Let's use it for ministry. Let's be a people that are generous. Let's not allow coldness to creep in. Because this is sadly what happened at Ephesus. 
The very one, Timothy, who was sent to Ephesus with this book, 1 Timothy, I believe this is one of the areas that they fell into. Because we see that in Revelation 2, verse 4 to 5. Listen to that quickly. But I have this against you. He's speaking to Ephesus. That you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. But if not, I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Did you know today you can actually go and tour the the excavation of the church at Ephesus? Because God removed the lampstand. And you go look at what he writes there in in Revelation 2, verse 4 to 5. It would seem that their heart grew cold in their love of God. Why? Because they had opulence. The love of money started to settle in. Let's not grow cold. The love of money can contribute to a gradual decline in spiritual fervor. No, let's let's rather grow hot for the Lord Jesus more in the ways in which he has looked after us. Let's be faithful. You see, when you're faithful with a little, he gives a little bit more to be faithful with. And he gives a little bit more to be faithful with. But we dare not look at the much that he gives us to be faithful with and go, Whoa, we've arrived. Wow. Look at us. Well done, Benoni Bible Church. Look at where we are. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't say well done. Praise God that you've been faithful. Praise God that you're loving him. Praise God that you're doing ministry. Praise God that you're serving one another. But let us never grow cold. The love of money can cause us to grow cold. Let me just give a few tips as regard to And I'm not going to give you many cross-references here. Let me just name them as a couple of safeguards against the love of money. You might be wondering, okay, well, how does this apply and how do I safeguard myself? Because all of us can fall into this. That's why Paul even warned Timothy. Timothy was being faithful at Ephesus. But Paul warns him. He says, flee these things. See, there's there's a caution for us at Benoni Bible Church. We need to be very careful, even as we have more that the Lord has blessed us with. That we do not fall into the love of money. We've got to be careful about this. We're even thinking as a leadership about our structures regarding our, our AGM. and We don't want to be Ill- like giving all of our time to these things. Because we must be about the ministry. And we must celebrate the ministry that the Lord is doing amongst us. Of course there needs to be the proper accounting. And that gets done. Believe me. It gets done better now than what it has ever been done in the life of the church as far as I can tell. It's been done well. But we want to be a people that celebrate the ministry that God has given us. And if he gives us more, then we must do more ministry with it. That's how we honor him. We pray about that. We say, thank you, Lord, for may this be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. But you know what sadly sometimes happens? God gives a little bit more and it's a test. We say, oh, let me put this aside. <laughs> no, nope. we don't operate like that as the body of Christ. We use what God blesses us with to bless others, to be generous with others. To double what we give to our missionaries. To to give. To not hold back. Okay, here's some safeguards. Remain rooted in God's word. There's the safeguard number one. Remain rooted in God's word. Secondly, foster a culture of generosity. In your home, in your heart, in our church. Let's be generous. Here we go. We're going to Spring Valley next week. Foster that generosity. Don't just give what you don't use. Give what you do use. Give the best. Think about ways that you can give, that you can bless, that you can be abundant in the way in which you give out. We must foster this as a congregation even. You know, praise God, we were able to send one of our missionaries away recently with money from Benoni Bible Church. We saw one of our missionaries was tired. We were able to say, let's be generous as a congregation. Let's pay for a time away for him and his wife. Let's be generous. Let's outdo one another in showing honor. But then also to safeguard this, there must be accountability and transparency. And that's where all of the accounting elements comes in at a local congregation. Praise God that we have Sage Online and we have an accounting firm and that we're able to do these things and everything gets logged. Every cent that gets spent, every slip that gets, that gets claimed, 
There's no such thing as, well, here's some money from the offering bag, pastor, because you claim something and that doesn't get said anywhere and recorded anywhere. No, it gets recorded. It's put down because there's accountability and there's transparency. And there must be this when it comes to finances. But then there also must remain a dependency and a prayerful dependency on God. Let's not ever stop praying as a church. I'm convinced that part of the reason, and a very big part of the reason, that the Lord has been so merciful to us in so many wonderful ways and so gracious to us is our men's prayer meeting on a Friday morning. Because our men are praying. Let's never stop praying. The Lord hears our prayers. He adds to our number and he blesses us as a congregation in marvelous ways. But that is all his goodness. Now we use that goodness that he gives us to bless him. Isn't that a privilege? So we prayerfully depend on God. And in conclusion, the love of money poses an absolutely significant threat to the integrity and the vitality of a local church. When we recognize the warning signs, when we learn from the biblical examples that we've looked at, when we safeguard against compromise, overseers as well as the congregation can ensure that our focus remains steadfastly on Jesus Christ. That's our end message. Stay focused on Jesus Christ. He's the one that we must focus on. All these other things he takes care of. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God will take care of it. We can confidently say that. When we are faithfully serving Jesus, we can confidently say he will take care of it. And he does. He looks after us. Look at how kindly he has looked after us as a local church. So as we reflect on that, being free from the love of money, let's remember to then examine each one of our own hearts. Lord, please reveal to us if there be a wicked way in us that we might repent, that we might turn to you, and that we might have a heart that is fully set on you. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for a time like this. Thank you for your word, which is a blessing to us as we've looked at various passages this evening. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who enlightens us towards the truth of your word. And Lord, we recognize that how, how easily we can be deceived by the love of money. Please, would you help us and guard us as a congregation, help us as a body of believers to love you, to love truth, to love your word, to love one another, to serve one another, to serve you, to use what you have given us for your glory and for the upliftment and the benefit of your local body. Thank you for a body of believers at Benoni Bible Church that we can be a part of. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the marvelous ways that you look after us. I marvel at the fact that you have looked after us in such a kind way. You have given us even ample. I thank you for the privilege that we have as a, as a church to to build something like what we have behind us and renovate without even needing to take money from a bank. We've been able to use money that, that was already in the bank, in the positive, that we haven't been needing to take a loan. We, we bless you for that, Lord. You have provided for us in marvelous ways, but we pray that we would never be dissuaded away from truth and away from your word and away from loving you because of the way that riches can be so deceitful. We thank you, Lord, that we've been able to put some of the very best things in, in our new kitchen that's coming with dishwashers and, and, um, and gas ovens and, and beautiful things that cost us a whole lot of money as a church. Keep us from the love of money. Keep us, O oh Lord, from sinning against you by starting to worship the things that we have. Keep us from a materialism that brings us to that fateful place where we grow cold towards you. We pray that you would guard us. Guard us at a time like this, Lord. There are temptations that, that you know about that come our way when we actually have. There's, of course, those temptations that come when we don't have, but there's temptations that come when we have, where we can often just put our trust in these things. Guard us from that, Lord. Please, would you help us as a body of believers to grow from strength to strength, trusting in you, loving you, doing that which is right, and trusting in you, Lord, for the guidance that, that we can only depend on you for. We pray that you guide us as a leadership, 
as a body of believers at Benoni Bible Church, our elders, our deacons, guard us as we have discussions about our future and about plans for the future and ways in which we can spend the money that you give us as a congregation towards the furtherance of your kingdom. We pray that we would be wise. We pray that we would be those that are circumspect. We pray that we would be those that, that guard what you give to us well, but that we would also, like a Mary, break the alabaster jar and use it for your glory, that the fragrance of our giving would even go up before your nostrils, that we would be a church that is generous towards the work of the ministry. We pray that you would help us in this, Lord. Thank you that you provide our every need. You look after the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet not even one of them falls to the ground without your say-so. And so we give you thanks, Lord, that you look after us. We pray that we would trust you, that in faith we would do that which you've called us to. I pray for my brothers and sisters here that if you are prodding them in their own heart, in an area where they need to be prodded by your Holy Spirit, that they would confess their sin before you, that they would repent if they have grown cold towards you, Lord, if they have grown dissuaded from trusting you like they should, or if some of the joy of the Spirit is no longer there, if they don't love you like they should love you, please, Lord, would you work in their hearts? And if they have grown to love things of this world too much, please, would you be merciful to them, help them to see it, and, and strip them from the love of things in this world. Give them that attitude of Job, naked I came into this world, naked I will leave it, and help them to be generous with what you've given them. Help us, O Lord, in all of these things, that we would worship you with our time, our effort, our energies, our intellect, our words, our lives. Guide our feet, guide our hands, guide our tongues, and work especially in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.